All right, folks, well, I want to welcome you here to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Dan Welch, and I'm a park ranger here at Gettysburg. And you've all have successfully found your way to our 3 o'clock program today entitled Care of the Wounded. Now, as I was mentioning, if you do have any questions during the program today, that's what I'm here for. I want to make sure each and every one of you uh, has an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. I just ask that you hold them till the end of the program, and we'll be able to stick around for as long as you'd like and chat about any questions you may have. Now, today's program is going to focus in on caring for the wounded, soldiers that have been injured in combat. Although we will spend a brief time today also examining how we're going to deal with some of these soldiers, Union and Confederate, that uh, become ill or sick along the way, pick up some of the diseases that these men will experience from 1861 to 1865. But particularly, we're going to focus in on how the wounded were treated here at Gettysburg. On July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg would wage on the fields around you. And after three days of fighting, 160,000 Americans, 95,000 Union soldiers, 75,000 con Confederate soldiers have participated in armed conflict. At the end of that 72 hours, 51,000 Americans had become casualties of the battle. Men that had been killed in action, men that had been wounded, on those fields of combat, others listed as missing or captured. And the focus of our program today, caring for those wounded. Over 27,000 Americans, Union and Confederate alike, Americans all, are in need of some sort of medical treatment following this battle. Now before we begin to discuss the care of the wounded following the Battle of Gettysburg, we need to take some time to catch us up with what is the state of medicine? in the 1860s leading up to the American Civil War. What is the state of medical training? What kind of education would you receive if you went into the field of medicine? And ultimately, more specifically to warfare, what is the state of battlefield medicine? If you were a soldier fighting in this war in 1861 at its outbreak, what would you experience then that may have changed along the way by 1863? So with that, let's take a little step back further in time before the Battle of Gettysburg, before the American Civil War, and begin to examine the state of medicine itself. Now, obviously, as you can imagine, back in the 1800s and 1700s, medicine is nothing like it is today. Uh, you weren't required to have any insurance cards or HMO plans to be able to be seen by a doctor uh, during this time period in our history. Uh, your doctor would be a, a, a local doctor serving a community at large, hopefully has had some sort of medical training, and I do say hopefully, we'll get to that part in just a moment about their level of education. But by and large, from the late medieval times into the 1700s and in the beginning of the 1800s, medicine is based on what's known as Brownism theory. <coughs> Brownism theory in its most simplest form is whatever ails you may be a cause of either having too much of one type of fluids, they call them humors, or not having enough type of fluids or humors in your body. So for example, let's say that uh, you may have a fever. And your doctor would come and diagnose this fever with its chills and its aches and its pains as you having too much of one particular humor, one particular fluid in your body is causing those symptoms. So how are we best going to deal with this? We have too much of that bad fluid, so we need to take it out of you. We're going to do all kinds of wonderful things. We made use some cupping, uh, which where through a suction of a, a glass jar container on your body, we're going to suck the blood through the pores out of your body. We may do some bloodletting, where we take some lancets and slice you and let you bleed freely. Uh, perhaps you suffer from headaches, constant migraines. Well, obviously something is, is wrong with the numbers, uh, levels of fluids in your head. So uh, we're going to drill into your head. We're going to relieve some of those fluids out of there to help you with that uh, symptom and problem as well. And so the state of medicine in the 1500s, the 1600s, as Jamestown is settled in Virginia in the early 1600s into the 1700s and early 1800s is not as advanced as we think uh, it is today. But it's going to come a long way by the time of the American Civil War. Across the 1800s, we see a lot of developments in Europe that will eventually make its way here to the United States. One of the big advancements in medicine in the 19th century is the invention of the microscope. 
Uh, no longer is it these levels of fluids or humors that are causing your problems. We are able to look at things we cannot see with the naked eye and begin to determine that, oh, these little creatures that move under the microscope may be causing our ailments, may be causing those illnesses and diseases. And with the invention of the microscope comes the idea of germ theory that we are able to pass germs from one another. We're able to pass bacteria from one another, pick germs and bacteria up off of, of uh, surfaces and animals and all sorts of different things, and that could cause some of our ailments, some of our illnesses and diseases. Flash forward about another 15 years or so over in Europe as well, we get another advancement to the field of medicine along the lines of germ theory. There's a doctor in 1860 that is putting together a correlation between washing your hands and how healthy people are. Imagine that, washing your hands after going to the bathroom, washing your hands before you prepare food, washing your hands after you handle raw chicken, washing your hands after you, uh, uh, you know, clean up garbage or something to that effect. By washing your hands, you will, are going to be less likely to become ill and seriously ill and require some sort of treatment. So we are seeing a number of medical advances across the 19th century in civilian doctor's practices. But what the 19th century is not going to have a lot of advancement is, is in battlefield medicine. And that's what we're going to be talking about in just a moment. What about the education? What kind of education and training are, are medical staff, medical professionals receiving across the 1800s uh, itself? It's not uh, nearly as long as it is today. I'm sure many of you are probably watching some of those medical reality shows. You may know a nurse uh, practitioner or a doctor uh, back home in your local community. These, these folks go to school for a very long time. They have numbers of years in college, and then they have uh, a residency, and then they work alongside like an internship, an apprenticeship. So they have a lot of training before they're ever allowed to treat patients by themselves. Not so much the case in the 1800s. Uh, there were a number of medical schools in this country across the 1800s. Uh, your average length of study at this time to become a doctor, just two years. Just two years, folks. And during that two years, although you would rely on some medical books of the era, a lot of what you are going to learn is going to be coming from your professors. Your professors would come in. You would listen to a very long lecture. You may jot down a few notes that later that afternoon or evening. You would work to learn from that lecture, memorize some of that lecture, uh, commit to memory some of that lecture. You would go to class the next day, and you, you would uh, have your professor ask you some questions about the pre previous day's lecture. Any questions about it? Something you didn't understand? Okay, let's go through it very quickly and move on. Uh, and this is what you're going to do for two years. You may have an opportunity during your time at medical school to uh, have a look at the human body through use of a cadaver, a body that's been uh, donated for science and research, but not every medical school across the United States at this time is going to have access to that type of material to research and learn from. So this is the state of medicine in the civilian life as the American Civil War is going to come to pass in 1861. And suffice it to say, our country, these two armies that are going to develop as the war begins, the Union armies and the Confederate armies, are wholly unprepared for what warfare will rot on a battlefield. In 1860, just one year before the American Civil War begins, folks, the entire United States military from Maine to California is just 10,000 men strong. These soldiers are spread out of very far remote outposts. Some of these men will uh, never encounter any real heavy campaigning or fighting uh, with Native Americans and other wars that we're participating in during this time period. Out of that 10,000 soldiers stretching from Maine to California, 130 of them are medically trained officers in the United States Army. 130 doctors for 10,000 soldiers stretched from Maine, California. If you're one of those soldiers that has been uh, assigned to a remote outpost in the West, maybe New Mexico Territory, Arizona Territory, you may serve your entire duration in the United States Army without ever seeing a medically trained officer as part of the United States Army. 
And so when the American Civil War breaks out in 1861, a war that many uh, politicians, many citizens, many men who join the army feel is only going to be 60 to 90 days, one big battle, it will be over. The medical situation in both armies is very bleak. A number of those 130 doctors in 1860 will ultimately end up joining the Confederate Army. And so we have a shortage immediately in the Union Army here in the Eastern Theater of the War amongst medically trained professionals in the Federal Army itself. 60 to 90 days, this war is over. We can get by with one big battle with the staff that we have uh, on hand. In addition to that, although we don't have a whole lot of surgeons for these men and these armies that are being created, we don't have a whole lot of stock and medical supplies, bandages, anesthesia, operating kits, everything you could imagine that a doctor or a surgeon would need today and then back then as well. So that's again not a big problem, right? One big battle, 60 to 90 days, this thing is over. We can get by with what we have on hand. What they will quickly realize, however, that that is not the case. And both armies will very quickly, as well as their governments, very quickly come to the conclusion that we need more medically trained men in the armies, we need more medical supplies, and we need to adjust some of the ways in which we go about treating those that are sick and treating those that will be wounded on the field of battle itself. Today we are going to focus on some of those advancements that will take place in the Union Army. And I don't just uh, say we're going to just do the Union Army because I happen to be a native Ohioan that uh, Ohio would stick with the Union Army or that we're in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're going to talk particularly about the advancements in the Union Army because one person, one man who many of you will never have heard of is going to make great advancements in the field of battlefield medicine that will not only impact those soldiers that become ill and sick during uh, the Gettysburg campaign but also that uh, will help uh, ensure the survival of many wounded soldiers here at Gettysburg uh, as well. Unfortunately there is no real Confederate counterpart uh, to the man that we are going to talk about next and his name is Jonathan Letterman. Jonathan Letterman is going to be brought into the Union Army in 1862, in the summer of 1862, and he has been hired for this job to help treat and get the Union Army back on its feet, because the medical situation in the Union Army at this point is very dire. Over the first year of the American Civil War, from 1861 to 1862, if we have mentioned, there's a, a, a lack of trained medical staff, a lack of medical supplies. And by the late spring, early summer of 1862, think about this for a second, 33%, one-third of the Union Army here in the Eastern Theater, known as the Army of the Potomac, are in hospitals. The men are too sick, too ill to fight. Letterman has been hired to remedy that. In addition to that, after these large battles of 1861 to 1862, men that have been wounded in combat, they're not being treated effectively, they're not being treated quickly. We are seeing uh, not a great survival rate among those that have been brought to those hospitals. Letterman has been hired as well to work on that. and He has a whole host of ideas that will revolutionize battlefield medicine during the American Civil War and how all of you experience the medical field today. And we'll move to that in just a moment. So what are the, some of the things then that Jonathan Letterman is going to do that's so revolutionary when he first takes uh, this position as medical director of the Union Army, Army of the Potomac here in the Eastern Theater? One of the biggest uh, threats to soldiers both north and south during the American Civil War are not cannonballs. They're not bullets, they're not bayonets or sabers. One of the biggest threats to Union and Confederate soldiers during the American Civil War is illness and disease. Would it surprise you to, to learn today, folks, that the number one killer in the American Civil War is something that we treat today with Pepto-Bismol or Imodium? The number one killer during the American Civil War, folks, is diarrhea. Take diarrhea and move it up to the next level to you're unable to make it stop, mix it with some blood, now you have dysentery and that is going to be just as deadly. Something that we fix today with Imodium and Pepto-Bismol will kill 300,000 Union soldiers in four years of the American Civil War. It is an astonishing, astonishing number. So illness and disease is going to be some of the greatest challenges for men of the Union and Confederate Army. And Jonathan Letterman, the new director 
uh, of the uh, Union armies, Army of the Potomac, is going to go about to change that and combat some of these illnesses and diseases that are so negatively and adversely affecting the men in the Union Army. The, 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 the ones that are in this hospital in the summer of 1862, 33%. He thinks that a lot of these illnesses and diseases that are crippling the army come from a lack of poor sanitation and hygiene. Poor sanitation and hygiene. I want you to completely dispel this notion of a Civil War armies uh, perfectly aligned, shoulder to shoulder, beautiful uh, ornamented uniforms and saber scabbards and, and shoulder scales and shoulder boards and things of that nature. I want you to think of these armies in the terms of their sanitation as big, giant uh, conglomerations of college-aged male bachelors. Think about that for a second. You are able to smell these armies before they get near you. Okay, their sanitation is not that great. First and foremost, these men are washing their clothes, their uniform, their underwear once every four to five months. They are taking a bath once every four to five months. Think about everything they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis that's going to work up a sweat, that will soak those undergarments, that will soak that uniform, and they're going to get up and repeat it the next day. They're not cleaning their, their uniforms, they're not bathing uh, their bodies, and they're not washing their uniforms. Poor sanitation. Again, getting back to that college-age male bachelor description, uh, these men, when they would form their camps, several hundred men, several thousand men in a large open field, if they were cooking around the fire, maybe done with their meal, instead of uh, taking to some central garbage collection to throw away the leftovers or some of the, the garbage produced by cooking, they're just going to throw it on the ground next to them and leave it there. And imagine three, four, five, eight thousand men in one camp just throwing their garbage at their feet and moving on. In addition to that, these men are not uh, going to use the designated bathroom. When we have these men in camp, at the very far end of the camp, we're going to dig a long ditch in the ground known as a latrine. When they dig this ditch, they're going to scoop down. They're going to shovel uh, the dirt from the hole in front. It's going to be a little seat if you have to do that sort of business at the bathroom. If not, you stand on top of the ground and, and go into the hole as well. Uh, these men will, by and large, in 1861-1862, before Letterman uh, comes uh, to play, you know, if they're in, in their tent, sleeping at night, they've got to get up and go to the bathroom, they just go right outside the tent. They're not going to walk to the very end of, edge of the camp to use the bathroom. They're just going right next to the tent. In addition to that, these men are uh, very confused with how water and streams and creeks work as well. Uh, those that are bathing, those that are washing, those that are grabbing their drinks, their water to cook from, their water to drink from, are grabbing it uh, from downstream, while upstream men are using the bathroom in the same water source. Another issue that is making these men sick in the Army. So the sanitation is not great. Then when Jonathan Letterman comes on board as medical director for the Army of the Potomac, and he is immediately going to set out a number of orders and protocols in order to increase the overall level of sanitation, which will therefore increase the overall health of the Army. So we can get these men to the battlefield and hopefully have an advantage of both men and means. One of the first things he's going to order is that garbage we talked about, leftover from the food. All that garbage needs to be emptied into a central location, and at the end of each day in camp, we're going to burn that garbage. Bathrooms, another situation. You're not going outside your tent or the closest tree anymore. It's mandatory you're going to use the latrine. And at the end of each day, six to eight inches of dirt must be thrown on that latrine. When it gets full, we're going to build a new one. We're also going to be very particular about the difference between upstream and downstream and what we are doing in that drinking water, what we're doing in that cooking water, uh, beyond uh, just bathing and using it for the bathroom and then downstream trying to cook with that same water. We're going to be very, very particular about educating our soldiers to know the difference and how to establish a camp around a, a shared water source. Uh, Letterman is also going to uh, make a suggestion. He never uh, makes an official order, but he's going to make a suggestion for the men to get their beards trimmed down very, very short and keep their hair very short as well. Some of the problems that Letterman is eliminating through these orders when it comes to sanitation has to do with how illnesses and diseases are being spread. 
Think about that garbage pile. Think about that latrine sitting open. Think about all of that uh, human waste. Flies, mosquitoes, insects coming to camp, feeding on that garbage, feeding on that human waste, and then coming biting you. And we're starting to see a lot of men become ill and sick. So just by taking charge and cleaning up camp and having these men bathe and wash their clothes, we're eliminating many of the illnesses and diseases that are going to be caused from insect bites. Uh, particularly when we talk about cleaning clothes, we talk about washing, we talk about keeping our hair short, we're going to ensure that we decrease body lice. Body lice is a huge problem in the Union and Confederate Army, so much so that soldiers are creating games in which to utilize the lice from their own bodies. We're putting a skillet, a pan over the fire, we're pulling the lice off, and we're going to take wagers and bets. My lice can last in this uh, heated pan longer than yours. My lice can jump higher than yours. Mine can crawl across the bottom of the pan faster than yours. We're coming up with all sorts of games from body lice. So Letterman is really going to target sanitation to increase the overall efficiency and health uh, of the army itself. After he accomplishes this, the next thing he is going to do, which is going to tie into the rest of our program today, uh, is how are we caring for the wounded on the battlefield. And again, we're going to spend time talking about Letterman, uh, not because uh, this is a Union slanted program, uh, but because we really lack a Confederate counterpart that is going to make so many revolutionary changes to medicine that we still feel today. One of the first things Letterman does is to look at how soldiers who are wounded in combat are removed from the battlefield. If you were a soldier on the battlefield and you were wounded, there was one of two ways you were getting off the battlefield. The first way was you were getting yourself off the battlefield. Imagine going through this experience of combat, being horrifically wounded, and now trying to figure out how am I going to get off the battlefield and where's the hospital? The second option you have is that the federal government in 1861 and 1862 to help get wounded off the battlefield would hire what essentially is modern day cab drivers today. Uh, these guys were known as hacks and they would own a wagon or they would own a carriage and if you were visiting a town such as Washington DC you could hire them and they would take you from stop to stop around the city. Well the federal government is hiring these private contractors to go to the battlefield with their carriage, go to the battlefield with their wagon, wait for the battle to be over, and then go out on the field, pick up the wounded, and take them to the hospital. When these uh, private citizens, these contractors, got out uh, to a potential site of a battle, and cannonballs start flying through the air, bullets start whistling through the air, these guys aren't sticking around. They're grabbing their carriage and wagon. They're going back to the nation's capital. Uh, to heck with the wounded, they can get themselves off the battlefield. I'm not risking my life. I'm not getting paid enough for this. Look at the horror that combat really is, that war really is. Letterman's going to set about changing all of that in the summer of 1862. He's going to establish a professional ambulance corps. And some of the things that he does with this ambulance corps will affect you today. One of the first things he wants to do is to standardize ambulance that is, ambulances that are being used in the Union Army. Before Letterman comes on board, I want you to think about this for a second. If you, we saw today three Civil War ambulances lined up, you could go to the first ambulance be full of bandages, stocked to the, to the gills with bandages with room to carry wounded soldiers. You could go to the second ambulance parked in the middle, full of scalpels, all the scalpels in the world that you could possibly imagine. Then you could go to the third ambulance and maybe it's loaded with anesthesia, chloroform or ether. Perhaps you're a wounded soldier that is in need of a bandage, but you're placed in the ambulance with the anesthesia. That does no good to you. Letterman is going to standardize ambulances in the Union Army, that each ambulance has the same number and uh, different things in it that could possibly be needed by wounded soldiers being transported. It doesn't matter if you are from Virginia today or if you are from Georgia or you live out in California. It doesn't matter what uh, owned ambulance company you may need to use in a time of emergency, but in 2015 every ambulance across the country has the same stuff in it. They may be a different make or model of type of ambulance, but they all have the same stuff in it. And that is an invention that Letterman is going to come to codify together in the summer of 1862. We're also going to train the men that will be driving the ambulances, which are uh, not obviously going to be driven by motor power, but 
physical, real horsepower. We're going to train these men to be professional ambulance drivers. Uh, if you have a very severely wounded patient uh, who is bleeding profusely, probably taking the rockiest, bumpy road is not going to help them, particularly if the wound clots on its own. We don't want to break that clot open and have the wounded soldier bleed to death before he even gets to the hospital. So we're going to train these men uh, in which how to drive the ambulances, how to know where to look for the hospitals and different aid stations along the way. We're going to train the, men, train the men that are riding with those ambulances to get the wounded off the field, stretcher bears. In 1861, 1862, in the early American Civil War, uh, this is the part where the musicians and the drummer boys come into play. When battle happens, they put down their instruments, they go out on the field, they get the wounded and help them put them on stretchers and get them off the field. But they are not trained. These men in 1861, 1862, and I should say young boys, not men, they would go across the battlefield, they'd come pick up a wounded soldier here, take them all the way back to the rear of the hospital. When they came back, they would come over here to this side of the battlefield. They would pick up a guy, put him on the stretcher, and take him all the way back to the rear, one at a time, in no systematic, organized fashion. Depending on the various uh, degree of your wound or where you were located, you could be left behind. You could be in serious need of medical attention and be the last to be taken. You could be someone who just needs a few stitches and be the first to be taken. We're going to train these stretcher bearers on how to place these men on the stretchers, how to get them into the ambulances, how to care for them if they are needed some sort of care between the field and the nearest aid station or hospital. So Letterman is going to standardize the ambulance corps. He's going to standardize uh, the ambulance uh, men that are working in it and standardize what's actually on the ambulances. Letterman is also going to codify a number of different protocols that have been developed across the country as well as in Europe. And I'm going to share with you a personal story today uh, that uh, is really going to implement what Letterman is going to pull together, really highlight what Letterman is going to pull together. We'll see if you can guess what Letterman is so instrumental in developing. I grew up in a part of Ohio from a very urban area. and I'll, I don't remember exactly what age I was, maybe eight or nine. I had the flu, very bad. Uh, for a couple days, high fever, all the wonderful symptoms that come along with the flu. And my parents thought, you know what, he's, he's pretty sick, pretty dehydrated. We should take him to the emergency room. It was on a weekend. Take him to the emergency room, have the doctor check him out, see if he needs any fluids, anything that we can do to, to help make him better. And so I can remember going to the emergency room and sitting in the waiting room. Like many of you, if you've ever gone to the emergency room, you sit there for a very long time. And I got to hold the official emergency room bucket because I had the flu sitting there for what seemed hours and all of a sudden the emergency room doors burst open and they're wheeling this guy in with a knife sticking in his leg. He got to go right back. I've been sitting there holding a bucket with the flu for the last couple hours and this guy just cut in line. What I just experienced as a child was one of the things that Letterman helped codify and it's known as triage. Letterman's going to pull together a different series of, of different protocols and practices happening in this country and in Europe as well and put them together into a system of triage. Those that uh, are less severely wounded on the battlefield and can wait for treatment, they're going to be the last to receive it. Those who need some sort of life-saving procedure that will not live if they wait are going to be treated first. Those that we cannot help, they'll be treated all the way at the end. And Letterman is going to establish this series and system of triage. He's going to train those ambulance drivers and those stretcher bearers in this system as well. So when a battle is over and we are beginning to, to take uh, the wounded back to the hospital, these ambulances that will arrive on the field, those stretcher bearers, uh, they are going to examine these men very quickly on the field if they've not been able to get themselves to an aid station or a hospital. They're going to place these men into a category according to the severity of their wound. That category will then dictate which level of care they need. Closest to the battlefield itself, we have aid stations, maybe an outdoor aid station, maybe something uh, under a tent of this size, but that would be uh, somebody needs a bandage, somebody needs some stitches, maybe you broke, you fell down, broke an arm or broke a leg, something that is not too serious. Uh, we're going to put you in that middle category. You can wait a while. Uh, the next category is going to be those that need some sort of life-saving operation uh, and they need it very quickly. You're going to be the first priority to put, put on the stretcher. We're going to bypass that aid station closest to the battlefield. We're going to take you to a much more uh, situated hospital further from the lines where they can deal with that wound. 
And last but not least, if you have been wounded uh, in some area of the body, such as the trunk of the body, from the waist to the neck, doctors at the time can do very little for you. We're going to put you very at the very end of picking you up off the battlefield. By the time you get to the hospital, you'll be taken to the one a little further to the rear because of the seriousness of your wound. We'll give you something to deal with the pain, but we're going to suggest you find somebody to write a letter home for you because this is going to be the last day or the last couple days of your life. There's nothing that these doctors can do for you. So Letterman is going to institute this practice of triage uh, to diagnose these men, get them to the appropriate levels of care, and get them treated very, very quickly. And by the time that Letterman institutes all these changes in the late summer of 1862, the Union Army's the Army of the Potomac here in the Eastern Theater will participate in several battles. Battle of Antietam in September of 1862, Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862, Battle of Chancellorsville in May of 1863. Letterman's system is able to be put into place and he's able to make adjustments to it and really uh, codify all these different uh, things that he has adjusted to the way of medical affairs in these armies to ultimately uh, save more lives. And so by the time of Gettysburg in July of 1863, Letterman's system has been in place for almost a year, and it is working very, very well. On June 28th, just three days before the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union Army will receive a new commander. His name will be General George Gordon Meade. The Union Army is very far behind the Confederate Army, and General Meade has several priorities of who should be on the road. We need soldiers, we need ammunition, and we need food on the road. The medical department, all of these things that Letterman has instituted, they can wait. We'll send them to the very back of the Union Army. So when this battle breaks out on July 1st, 1861, and over the next 24, 48 hours, these medical personnel that have experienced this new system invented by Letterman are going to be at a disadvantage, but they will do quite well here at Gettysburg. After the Battle of Gettysburg is over then, what are some of the wounds that these doctors are going to be faced with treating? Uh, things that they have, going to have been seen since 1861, 1862, and will continue to see for two more years of war. Well, let's look at some of the implements that will be causing such devastation and destruction to the human body. And then at the very end of the program today, we're going to need a volunteer uh, to assist in treating one of these uh, types of wounds. Let's go ahead and uh, begin by examining one of the, the least common wounds during the American Civil War itself. And that is going to come from one of these, a bayonet or a saber. Now, if you've seen a Civil War movie, if you've seen a Civil War documentary on television, uh, it, it's a lot of drama to have thousands of men in this movie and this documentary all put their bayonets on and charge all across the field uh, and fight just with their bayonets. The bayonet and saber is the least, uh, least cause of wounds during the American Civil War. I want you to think about this for a second. It was estimated that every soldier that served in the American Civil War was wounded three to four times each year. Three million Americans would serve in either army during the American Civil War. If we take that higher number, four wounds per soldier per year, that would be 12 million wounds for each year of the American Civil War. Four years of war gives us about 48 million wounds in all. Out of those 48 million wounds, less than 1% come from a bayonet or a saber combined. Now, despite uh, not having a significant amount uh, of occurrences, uh, documented occurrences of these being used in combat and having wounds that will need to be treated by these, although there are examples, uh, this is a very devastating wound. One of the things that you may notice about the bayonet is its overall shape. It's in the shape of uh, what would appear to be a triangle. Now, if you cut yourself with a sharp knife today and you needed stitches, that, that cut is going to be a for the most part, a straight line. And all we have to do is pull that skin back together again. But I want you to imagine the shape of a triangle in your palm. How are you going to pull that together symmetrically? You're not. You are not going to be able to pull together to stitch up a wound from one of these. This, the wound that a bayonet will cause to the human body is very, very devastating. And it'll be one of the reasons why, following the American Civil War, we're going to see the bayonet change from this triangular-shaped type weapon to something we think of more like a knife today. 
and we are going to see that very prolifically across the 20th century. So some soldiers may be coming to the hospital in need of treatment from a bayonet or saber wound. Another type of wound that soldiers may experience on the field of battle will come from artillery. So all sorts of artillery shells uh, and types of artillery ammunition used during the American Civil War. We have those solid cannonballs that will bound, bound and skip across the ground. We also have exploding cannonballs, types of ammunition. And those exploding rounds will produce something that looks like this. This is a uh, piece of Civil War shrapnel uh, from an exploding ammunition a round of artillery. Think of a hollow cannonball filled with black powder on a fuse. When that fuse runs out, that cannonball explodes. And explodes in about five or six chunks, about the size of what you see here. Again, known as shrapnel. Shrapnel uh, is going to actually be a person. This type of exploding round of ammunition for artillery, for cannons, is named after its inventor, Henry Shrapnel. So we're going to see soldiers coming to the hospital with wounds from artillery fire. But perhaps the most common wounds that are bringing men from the battlefield to the hospital are going to be caused from one of these. Bullets. This is one of the most common types of bullets used during the American Civil War, a 58 caliber mini ball. We've Americanized it a little bit. We call them mini balls, but it's actually pronounced Manet after its inventor, Claude Manet. What is so deadly about these projectiles is twofold. Number one, the material it's made out of. It's made out of lead. Lead is a soft metal. It's very malleable. The second thing that makes this so deadly is how fast it is fired out of the weapons of the era. This is moving very, very slowly through the air. And when it strikes something hard, such as the human body, these bullets, this shape, this conoidal shape, is going to flatten out and it will cause all sorts of damage. Let me show you a little comparison as to what this is going to look like before and after it strikes something hard. Well, which is before? This is the before right here. This is the after it strikes something hard. Now these bullets these Manet balls, because of the speed at which they're traveling, because of the, the uh, material they're made out of, they cause untold destruction to the human body, particularly when it strikes something hard, such as a bone. When it strikes the bone itself, it's going to shatter the bone on impact. Think about your bone breaking down to dozens of little pieces about the size of toothpicks. In addition to shattering that bone on impact, it's also going to shiver the bone meaning that it is going to crack the bone in either direction from the impact site. The best thing that doctors can do during the American Civil War with this type of wound is to amputate the limb. To find out where that shivering ends, where that cracking of the bone ends, go up about four to six inches and to amputate the limb. Now you would think that today in 2015 with all of our advanced medical technology in the last 150 years we could do something uh, much better than Civil War surgeons could do back then. But if for whatever reason right now on August 2nd of 2015 you were shot with one of these Manet balls and it broke, shattered one of your limbs, uh, we would put you in an ambulance, we'll send you to Gettysburg Hospital just two blocks down the road. And we're going to keep you comfortable. We will fly in the best surgeon in the world to come and take a look at your wound. The best thing they can do for you today, in August of 2015, is to amputate. There's no sort of medical advancement that can repair the damage that these things do to bones in the human body. Now, I don't want you to walk away from the program today misunderstanding uh, the options that these Civil War doctors and surgeons had with these wounds. There's this perception that Civil War surgeons, doctors, they're butchers. They're just out there. They're amputating away. Every guy that comes in has got a, a broken pinky toe, and they amputate his whole foot off. Uh, these men are able to grow with their profession from 1861, 1862. By the time they get here to 1863, they're able to diagnose what exactly uh, they can or cannot do to treat this wound effectively. And this is the part of the program where we are going to need a volunteer for you to be able to understand those decisions that they have to make on the operating table uh, from one of those wounds. So do we have a, a volunteer today? All right. Yes, young man. Why don't you come down? What's your name? Jacob. Jacob. Have a seat up here, Jacob. 
Oh, you can just pop on up. It'll hold you. All right. Jacob has been fighting here at the Battle of Gettysburg, and Jacob today is going to represent one of 27,000 Union and Confederate soldiers that have become wounded as part of the Battle of Gettysburg itself. Uh, Jacob is uh, making his way by stretcher and ambulance to a hospital in the rear of the Union lines, and uh, Jacob has arrived with an injury to his lower left leg. So I'm going to have you swing your feet up here, Jacob. I'm going to have you scooch down a little bit. There you go. I want you to lay down. Plenty of room. Perfect. All right. So once Jacob arrives, he may have a little wait at the hospital. Hospitals are going to be staffed with 7, 8, 10, 12 surgeons there. Each surgeon, on average, is going to be working about 20 to 22 hours each day following the battle, uh, treating anywhere from 70 to 100 patients a day. Uh, so we've got a long line of patients behind us, and Jacob may have to wait a little bit uh, before he is brought to the table for examination and then a determination of what to do. Uh, for our story today, Private Jacob in the Union Army has been wounded by one of those Manet balls in the lower left leg. It has uh, impacted his shin. We need to determine what is best for Private Jacob. One of the first things that I need to do once he is placed on the table itself is to control the bleeding. Before I examine the wound, before I make a decision as what is going to be best for our patient today. Uh, Civil War surgeons, doctors, medical personnel have tourniquets during the American Civil War. and We are going to use one of those tourniquets to stop the flow or slow the flow of blood uh, altogether. During the American Civil War, all different types of makers of tourniquets. We have a very simple tourniquet here today. Again, we're going to go up a number of inches uh, above to stop the bleeding. Lift your left leg up, Jacob. All right. And we're going to go ahead and lower that down. We're going to stop or slow down the flow of blood. What this is going to allow for me to do is to, again, examine the wound uh, and then be able to make a determination as to what exactly we need to do. Now, another myth that uh, is going to be applied to Civil War surgeons, medical staff, is uh, that these men are operating on soldiers while they're awake. And that is simply not the case. We have anesthesia during the American Civil War, and this is going to be the next step for Private Jacob today. Two types of anesthesia that will be commonly used during the American Civil War, ether and chloroform. Now, how many of you have had uh, wisdom teeth removal surgery? Okay, all right, so you know how that goes. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever had any of those oscopies. Uh, but whether you've had one of those oscopies or you've had your wisdom teeth out, you have received an, a level of anesthesia known as twilight. You're put into a very light, sedated sleep. You don't remember the surgery of having your wisdom teeth out. You don't remember uh, the oscopy, the scoping that you had done. But you are not 100% knocked out. Your brain is still very much awake. And when that procedure begins, your brain is going to kick in a part of your nervous system uh, that we call your flight or fight reactions. Your brain saying, hey, this hurts. Let's get away. Why are they doing this? How can we stop this? And so it is very common uh, when we put uh, the patients in the American Civil War under anesthesia in this level of twilight that when we begin to examine the wound or begin to operate on the wound, a patient's arms may start moving up and down. Go ahead, Private Jacob. Keep doing that. Could you imagine the next guy waiting in line for the operating table seeing that guy do that? You're thinking, oh my gosh, the surgeon is operating on this guy while he's awake. And slowly but surely over time, that myth is going to begin to grow. And it's simply not the case. It's his body's fight or flight reactions uh, taking charge uh, despite that level of anesthesia that he's in. He's asleep. He's asleep. So we are going to place uh, several drops of chloroform or ether on uh, an ether cone. Think of like a funnel that you use for car oil. It's got a piece of coral sponge in it. We're going to hold that above his face and for several seconds, have him take deep breaths, and very quickly he'll go into that twilight. And now as the surgeon with several of uh, my medical assistants, my staff with me, we can start uh, the actual examination of the wound. We have some options for examining the wound. Uh, we may start with one of these. This is known as a bullet probe. 
you can see it has a bulbous tip on it. Uh, that bullet probe is co coated in a porcelain coating. And uh, once we insert it into the wound, if that porcelain coating hits something metal, you'll hear that little ping or that ding noise. That tells me where that piece of metal is and it will help me uh, to find it to get it out. Uh, however, using this equipment, it takes a little while. It's slowing me down. I got a long line of wounded patients behind me. So instead, I'm going to prefer to use something that is much faster, much more medically advanced. You ready to see this, this tool, this piece of medical technology? I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to insert it into the wound, uh, looking for any sort of debris that's been carried into the wound, looking for what the wound has been caused by, that bullet in our story today, and if it can be removed. If I can find the bullet pretty readily, I'm going to grab a tool developed just for such case, a pair of bullet forceps. We'll insert that bullet forceps into the wound, grab a hold of that Manet ball, that artillery shell fragment, whatever the case may be, and go ahead and pull that out. Uh, if we can't seem to find the projectile, uh, that's okay. It'll come out uh, when we continue on with the operation today. Uh, after examining the wound for Private Jacob, I've determined that the best thing for him today is to receive an amputation below the knee. So we are now going to begin to uh, participate uh, uh, interactively, if you will, with this operation. So one of the things that we need to do next is to grab a scalpel. And we've got all sorts of scalpels to choose from depending on where on the, the human body that the wound is located and where we are going to be performing the amputation itself. These scalpels are very, very sharp. Uh, it's not going to take a whole lot as we begin to cut in through the skin and the muscle. But we'll stitch you back together at the end. It's okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we are going to cut through the skin and muscle itself. And then we are going to need to push that uh, uh, skin and muscle up to expose the broken part of the bone and help determine where there is good bone that is left. Generally, again, we're doing this operation several inches above the site of the wound. Once we have utilized the scalpel, uh, we have exposed the bone itself. Uh, you can imagine at this point all of the bleeding that is going on. You can imagine all of these sort of foreign bodies that would be in there, i.e. that shrapnel. Uh, the bullet would have had to have gone through his uniform. So we've got bits of wool in there, bits of his underwear in there. Uh, if he was uh, anything else, maybe the bullet traveled through a soldier's next to him, his knapsack or his canteen. So we've got all kinds of stuff in there that we're going to have to deal with once we've exposed it. But to ensure that Private Jacob does not bleed out as we continue to deal with those things today, we need to tie off all those veins and arteries that we have opened by using that scalpel. So we are going to take our suture and some silk thread, and we are going to begin to tie off each one of those veins and arteries to control the bleeding further. We're going to leave a good portion of silk thread, a little excess thread on the very end, and we'll see why at the end of the program, the end of the surgery today. Before we tie off that last vein or artery, however, we are going to make sure that Private Jacob wakes up feeling really well. So I'm going to reach in and I'm going to grab out of uh, my medical kit here some powdered morphine. And we're going to sprinkle that onto that last vein or artery before I tie it up. We have introduced that painkiller into the blood, the circulatory system. It'll go to the heart. The heart will continue to pump and spread that morphine, that opium, through the body itself. So when Private Jacob wakes up, we already have a painkiller on board. I have to be very, very measured with how much I use. Just this much too much, and I will have created an opium addict following uh, his surgery. And it's something we often do not talk about during Civil War studies, soldiers that are going to be addicted to opiates after the American Civil War from a surgery, from an operation itself. So we've got that last vein or artery tied up. We have the bone exposed. I need to remove any of those foreign bodies that I discussed. So I'm going to debris the wound itself. We get a pair of uh, tweezers, kind of look ladies like your tweezers that you have in your beauty bag, your makeup kit. We're going to go ahead and remove as much of those bone shards, as much as the uniform parts, as much of the stuff that we can find. We're going to get it out of the wound itself. Once I've debrided the wound, I'm ready for the next phase of the operation today. And perhaps the uh, coup de grace for many of you coming on this program, that of the capital saw or the bone saw. 
Again, Civil War soldiers, or surgeons, excuse me, get that myth of being butchers. They are not here hacking on this poor soldier's leg all day. It is a very quick process. One, two, three. Three cuts and the leg has been completely severed. The limb will be placed in a bucket near the operating table and may be handed to an assistant. Uh, either way, once that bucket fills, once the pile in the area fills, we'll move it out a little bit further away from the operating theater and the surger surgeries for patients will continue. One of the last things we need to do now once the limb has been removed is to close up. We're going to push down that uh, muscle that we pushed aside or push down that skin and we're beginning to form a stump. Before we close up, however, we need to file down the bone itself. I've used a serrated blade to cut that bone off. If I leave that bone sharp and jagged, uh, it will be uh, very discomforting to the, the survivor. Uh, it'll rub and cut and irritate the muscle uh, and the tendons and the ligaments that are in there. And it could even lead to further injury. Case in point, Confederate General Richard Stoddart Yule. Richard Stoddart Yule in August of 1862 was fighting during the Second Battle of Manassas. He couldn't see the fighting and what his men were doing through the smoke, so he got on his hands and knees to look under the smoke and to check on the progress of the fight. While on his knee, a Union bullet crashed through his kneecap, traveled the entire length of his leg, broke his leg. Surgeons on the battlefield would amputate his leg and he would recover for the next four months. On Christmas Day in the capital of the Confederacy, December 25th, 1862, Richard Stoddard Yule is out on crutches, enjoying the holiday. One of those crutches hits a patch of ice. Richard Stoddard Yule slips and falls. When he falls, that bone cuts through the newly healed stump, and it will require a secondary amputation and uh, further healing. The Battle of Gettysburg and the Campaign of Gettysburg will be his first time back to the Army since August of 1862. Very important that we smooth and shape down that bone for the stump that we are now going to create. So we've taken care of that, and now we're going to begin to close. We're going to sew up that stump again with our uh, silk thread and our sutures. And before we close the wound up all together, uh, we're going to leave a small hole for drainage. Civil War doctors and surgeons love to see pus. Pus is a good sign that the patient is healing, recovering from that wound. Uh, so we're going to leave just a small opening at the bottom, the base of that stump. And you may remember all that extra silk thread that we had when we tied off those veins and arteries. We're going to pull all those silken threads through that uh, small hole that we've left open. We'll bandage the wound itself and we'll move Jake to a private Jake uh, to a, a place of comfort where he'll wake up feeling no pain from the powdered morphine. I want you to go ahead and sit on up there, Jake. Uh, over the next several days, his bandage is going to be changed repeatedly. Uh, we are, again, looking for signs of pus. We don't want that pus to stink, however. It's got a really nasty uh, smelling Munster cheese flavor to it. Uh, that is not good news at all. Gangrene is setting in. We're going to have to uh, perform another operation, another amputation to help him out with that. But after two to three days of recovery, being placed on a strict diet of liquids, broths, waters, coffees, teas, things of that nature, we're going to bring Private Jake back before the surgeon for a checkup, see how he is doing. And this is where the surgeon begins to talk to Private Jake about his home life. Where are you from? Uh, Florida. He's from Florida. He joined the Union Army, folks. Uh, uh, he's from Florida. Well, tell me a little bit about Florida. And while I'm engaging him in conversation, I have examined the wound and I've grabbed onto those silken threads. And while he is deep in conversation, telling me where he's from, if he's received any letters from home, he's received any letters from home, he's going to say, yes, he did. And I'm going to pull on those threads. And if those threads slip off all the veins and arteries very easily, come out that hole, I know that the, the wound has healed, or is healing, I should rather say. However, if I give those things a yank and they don't budge, you say, Ow. Ow, really loud. That tells me that there is some sort of irritation, some sort of swelling, inflammation. Uh, and that I am going to have to schedule Jake to come back and see me later today where I'm going to perform a secondary amputation. I'll go up a little higher, take off a little more, and we'll repeat the process again. 
Now it took us today about 15 minutes to talk through the uh, uh, length of an amputation uh, at best. Uh, a really good Civil War surgeon, six, seven minutes, would be able to perform the operation that we just discussed. Again, uh, dispelling some of those myths that these Civil War surgeons are butchers, they're just hacking away at limbs. Uh, an amputation in the case of this type of wound is the best course of treatment. Private Jake uh, being brought from the battlefield, triaged very quickly, receiving treatment, that amputation very quickly has an 80% chance of survival from this wound in an operation. If the wound was to be kept, if for whatever reason the doctor decided not to amputate, if he tried to perform what is known as a resection, where we pull out all the damaged bone and we shorten the limb, but he gets to keep the limb. It's not functional, but it's there for appearance. He only has a 30% chance of survival if we keep the limb. So this was the best course of treatment for Private Jake today. Let's give Jake a round of applause today. You may return back to your family and recover from your wound. Well, folks, over the last hour today, we have explored uh, the state of medicine in our country in civilian life in the 19th century, the level of education that uh, these doctors and surgeons received, and ultimately the developments that would occur between 1861 and the battle here at Gettysburg to 1863 and beyond in battlefield medicine. If you have any questions from the program, please stick around. I'd love to talk to you about them. If you would like to see any of the tools utilized uh, by a Civil War doctor or surgeon, please feel free to stick around. Well, we hope to see you next time here at Gettysburg National Military Park. Take care, folks. <laughs>